morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here, and thank you very much for an introduction. I heard about this conference many times, but this is the first time in Samara, so I'm really happy to be here. I have a lot of slides, but not many equations, so you will see quite many videos. I hope this talk will be kind of for general public. So basically, I will talk about the multi-sensory, so vision, auditory, and touch, and also we will, I will BCIs. And I will also try to show some examples of the practical application for the like dementia monitoring or dementia biomarkers, which is really super hot topic now in Japan. So just quick introduction. I am from the Riken Advanced Intelligence Project. It's one of the Riken centers. We are very lucky because our center is in the very central Tokyo. If you would visit Tokyo, we are just next to Tokyo Station, direct train to both airports, so we are very easy to, to meet. So this is our like, no introduction. This is Professor Sugiyama, who is our director, very young director, so we are very blessed to have the center. And since we talk about the industry and possible applications, let me show you this Gartner curve. So I spent some time in a startup before, and very often, like VCs, they're asking, like, you know, how useful is the BCI? So Gartner is a huge, like, you know, this kind of consulting company. Brain computer interfaces on this kind of climbing tiger curve, like, you know. So it's kind of expected that it will bring a lot of, like, you know, money and, like, in applications. If you look at the deep learning, it's already at the top, so soon it will slide down and like, you know, people will forget. Virtual reality, augmented reality is already like, you know, beyond. So BCI is a very hot topic. And what we are very much interested in, we have this beautiful now GTEC system combining EEG and NIRS, but we want to push everything into wearables. So on the right side, you will see some prototypes of our wearables, like eyeglasses and so on, because we believe that one day people will use at home very simple devices. They record super noisy EEG. So what we do with our machine learning and deep learning, we try to bridge it from clinical level recordings into this kind of very simple wearables, like, you know. So that's the goal, and I hope you will see some, like, you know, applications during my talk. Also, I will try to kind of, I kind of structure my talk, kind of going, kind of, I, this is, I think, from Professor Zander's paper, kind of nice uh, definition of different BCIs, reactive BCIs, active BCIs, and finally, passive BCIs, which are most interested to us. So I will kind of go one by one. If you are really interested, this is a website of our, my research group, so like, you know, please visit. All the videos, all the information is there. And this is our laboratory in Riken AIP. So I am mostly a researcher. This is my main job. And this is Professor Dr. Otake in the center. So she's from robotics, so you will see also, I think maybe I kind of remove, but basically we also want to include the robots in this case for, the, for the, our rehabilitation or diagnostic purposes. So this is kind of gallery of many videos of, that my students develop. I will explain some of them. But basically, you can see, once you have a very solid brain-computer interface paradigm, you can really plug it into many different applications. Auditory spelling, managing robots, going into virtual reality, and so on. So this is really important that we really kind of build very solid neuroscience-based applications. And also, as you know, we have many like, you know, modalities we can monitor brain, but they have kind of like, you know, positive and negative effects. So we mostly focus on the EEG. So EEG is now to have very good temporal resolution, but horrible spatial resolution. So we can really tell when something is happening, but there is no way to tell exactly where. On the other side, on the other, like, you know, this is the kind of part of this plot, there would be fMRI and so on, kind of modalities which have very good spatial resolution, but they have horrible temporal res resolution. So there is also a question if we can, like, you know, match them together. And that's what we try now these days. Oops. I went wrong direction. Okay, so this is this combined, like, you know, monitoring of the EEG and NIRS. So basically, you can have, like, you know, optical information from the blood oxygenation and electrical activity from the brain, like, you know, electrical activities, and in the end I will show how important this is for the dementia, like, you know, when we have two types of dementia monitoring. So let me quickly talk about the reactive BCIs. So most of my talk today will really focus on this sort of famous P300 response. So this would be an example for two different modality experiments, but it's usually exactly the same, like, you know, positive bump. Around 300 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimuli, if you recognize it, and it's kind of like you know, beyond control even, we will have this kind of very nice, what we call very nice, is like four like, you know, microvolts or something. So it's a teeny tiny signal, but we can really classify between if they will recognize and interact, like you know, if intentional response to this uh, uh, stimulation or not. So most of my talk, and I will show you visual, auditory, tactile uh, application for that. And again, if you are interested, please check my review paper in the Frontiers in Robotics when actually I put this everything together, like, you know, so there's kind of nice review. So let's go for the first example. So this was like, you know, kind of video we do for the two students. They developed two different BCIs, but they were both based on the P300 response. 
So on the right side, you see the student who is using auditory BCI. She's wearing headphones. And we created a so-called head-related transfer function related response. I will talk about this later. And she basically interacts with the BCI and manages the robot through the, her auditory responses. On the left side, there was a student. He was wearing a glove. This is a tactile glove when we stimulate his fingers. So basically, he was focusing attention on, on his touch sensation. And in this case, again, also he could control the robot. And in this video, again, on the YouTube, you can see the full version. They kind of like, you know, reproduce exactly the same kind of walking pathways. Basically, robots have pre-programmed, in this case, like, you know, walking commands. And we just send via Wi-Fi, like, you know, which commands are given by the operators. So let's move quickly to the auditory BCI. And this was one example, like, you know, in Japan, and also for many LS subjects, like, you know, spelling communication is very important. Unfortunately, in Japan, they have 48 characters in the alphabet, so it's quite tough. Like, you know, using this kind of classical like, you know, patterns that I use for the Latin characters are very difficult. So in this case, we created kind of nice like, virtual environment of the surround sound. So you will see like 10 loudspeakers in the two lines. Those flashing letters are kind of imposed in the video, so basically you can see when sounds are coming from different directions. And they can subject quite easily. Our auditory system is very good, very like, sensitive for the surround sound information, you can really focus attention on different directions. So we have content, A, E, U, E, O, these Japanese letters, plus we have direction. And what is really nice, you can really learn very easily. So in my case, we had also Chinese student who quickly in, made this interface in Chinese. Luckily, they have kind of similar spelling. So basically, in this case, myself, I don't speak Chinese, but I could really learn like, you know, the special patterns. And I started spelling something in, 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 in Chinese. So it's really, really easy case. And then. Once we want to kind of more like, you know, dig that kind of virtual auditory space, we also know that our ear hearing system is very sensitive for the movement. So in this case, the students, he developed kind of uh, moving sound interface. So we are using headphones, and again, like, you know, sorry, in this one, we are using loudspeakers, and we created kind of like sensation of moving sound. So basically, sounds traveling between different loudspeakers. This was everything in the horizontal plane. So one, on the left side, you will have very static. Sound is coming from the loudspeaker, so there is fixed like, you know, position. On the right side, sound was traveling. Like, you know, in the left, right, going towards the face, and I think two examples were kind of going through the head. So very nice, very funky. When we ask our subjects, luckily, majority of them really prefer this moving sound. It's like, you know, it's like a video game, like, you know, something that's really interesting. It's not that boring, like, you know, focusing attention on a single point. When you look at the ERPs, you will see at the top, you know, both matrices on these plots, they were kind of nicely reproducible. So both the static sound and the dynamic sounds were quite good. If you look at the really on the right side top matrix, there will be more red color, which really shows that the response to the virtual moving sound was kind of stronger. So we kind of helped the classifier to do the better job in this case. And since we had this nice like acoustic virtual environment, we could really make this kind of like a half sphere, like, you know, and this is really like beautiful already virtual game. So in this case, the other student created kind of really patterns of sounds traveling in the half sphere. So really you can make kind of like feeling that like, you know, like a fly, it's like, you know, or some kind of like a you know, mosquito is flying ar ar around your head. It's really nice. And in this case, also, we could confirm beautiful those P300 responses, so the kind of purple versus uh, the blue one. So for auditory, we have quite often lower amplitude, but then the latency would be longer. So again, we have the classifier, but kind of making more features. Now so we have more, um, in this case, tem temporal features. So I have really many examples, so I have to move quickly. So also, as we are in the month model case, we also wanted to compare whether combining both visual and auditory modality would help. And this is very kind of negative response. This paper has nicely very quite many citations. So we compare when we only show, in this case, again, it was kind of spelling case, so letters coming from different direction. We could also this kind of giant screen, so we could kind of like, you know, make the uh, same combination of the sound and the, in this case, letters. So on the left side, at the top, it will be visual, audiovisual, and sorry, auditor and audiovisual. So what we really could see in this case, unfortunately, once you combine visual and audiovisual, the visual takes over everything. Like you know, there is really no benefit for the simple paradigm to combine visual and, aud uh, and auditory information. So sometimes we have to be also very careful. Once you design multimodal interfaces, you really have to see if you don't kill actually, don't like you know, in this case, classifier because classifier is doing the final job. So okay. So we move 
even more further, and in this case, in some environments, maybe here it's very quiet, but sometimes it's really noisy. So even using like, you know, headphones, or in some cases you should not use headphones because you want to use your auditory attention. In this case, we can use bone conduction auditory, in this case, information. So we just attach kind of small vibrators, and those are really teeny tiny, like those kind of metallic vibrators. So kind of like a small loudspeakers, we don't have cones, but they cause vibration of your bone. So basically, acoustic information is traveling through the bone. Resolution is much lower in this case, but in this case, there is no need to cover the ears. Also, for some subjects, there were kind of suggestions that some ALS subjects, because they have a lot of fluid in the ear, their kind of acoustic usual hearing is not so good. So we can enter the auditory system through the bone, bone, bone conduction. And again, beautiful responses. We have nice P300s, like, you know. So again, it's really possible to do it. And it's like, you know, as good as usual auditory system. Those vibrators are really cheap. They're even cheaper than usual, like, you know, headphones. So there are another students, and you already could see this kind of robotic uh, paradigm. So basically, not always we can have many loudspeakers. In this case, we can really focus on the headphones, like, you know. And there is very known paradigm in the acoustics, so-called head-related impulse response. So basically, for each of our heads, you can go to the like, an acoustic chamber and really measure your face acoustic response. So then we can build linear filters and really kind of play you back sound coming from different directions. Since it's very expensive and kind of annoying to measure this HRFR all of us, there are many databases that already measure those kind of responses. So we kind of decided to make kind of like a mean, like, you know, average, in this case, response, and we play better our subject. So it's not perfect, but it's really rep possible to reproduce different directions, like, you know, in our case, it was like limited number to 16. So for that one, as already we could see, if it worked very well for the robots, and also should it for, for, for the spelling, so in case of using all the loudspeakers, and this is like usually off-shell headphones, nothing special, we use this head-related transfer function and we kind of play sound from different directions. It worked very well. And since I have only eight minutes, we move quickly to the tactile BCI. And again, taking everything from the neuroscience, we know our hands are very sensitive, like you know, and we have like, you know, our tactile sensation is kind of like a backup sense. So we designed very simple like, interfaces using vibrators. So basically, just, again, like loudspeakers will have the cones, so they vibrate, but they don't generate sound. And again, beautifully, those P300 responses were really fantastic. So this is different modality. Beginning could be slightly different, but then the P300 really works very well. And we kind of plug it for different, like, you know, like virtual reality. I will show you some videos. So basically, we wanted to use them like, you know, for managing games, kind of simple, like, you know, in this case, environments. So the second case, we also made this glove. Again, sorry, this is kind of a very old picture, but this was like, you know, made by the student kind of very first, like, you know, uh, prototype. So basically, those small vibrators, usual kind of garden glove, and we could kind of nicely stimulate different parts of, of the fingers. And this will be kind of nice demo when the, like, you know, so we are starting. Sorry, the video is not so good because <laughs> the glove is gone. But basically, focusing attention on different fingers, which are translated different directions, in this case, is possible. This is kind of like a real-time monitor, like walking inside is very simple, like, you know, I think Unity 3D, virtual environments so are kind of walking around, maybe not the most fun. And again, we can also combine, and in this case, you, we have like vibration and the bone conduction auditory, because once we had a like, you know, cap on the head, we can put inside those kind of big metallic uh, pieces that would be the kind of vibrating, like, you know, devices which can cause like touch sensation on your head, very nice, like a, hat, uh, it's like a massage on your head. Plus, if you do it in the acoustic frequencies, which are luckily above the EEG, so we don't interfere with those both measurements, we can also make this kind of sound sensation. So it's kind of multimodal, again, the uh, paradigm. And again, sorry, we didn't have many environments, so this would be same demo, when in this case we are kind of managing this walking guy. Oops, it's not playing. Okay, it's playing, anyway. So let's move more forward. So again, in this tactile area, we can focus on the vibration, but we can also use pressure. And you know, like, you know, from the blind people world, they're using braille, like, you know, code, in this case, to kind of, because our fingers are very sensitive. So we made kind of giant, like, a braille code, like, you know, that kind of, that kind of generator. There will be, like, three by three pins matrix. And we just generate different, so this is kind of very friendly on the hand. And we generate different patterns when the subject can learn, like, you know, in this case, too. And again, we can plug it into the managing of the robot. So again, based on your focus of the attention of different patterns, which are translated into commands for the robots, you can make this kind of robot work. There will be like only nine commands, but you can imagine you can like, you know, we can do it with the both hands and so on. 
it's also possible to use it for like kind of managing the like, you know, uh, wheelchair. So basically, I am a healthy person, but I was usually a kind of test subject. So in this case, again, I am keeping my hand. It's not any joystick. It's just kind of like a you know, tactile device. And basically, based on my responses, I can make this kind of wheelchair move. So we kind of check like every 500 milliseconds. Again, videos maybe not, 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 not fantastic. On the YouTube is everything. But finally, I end up kind of going through the door. So basically, without breaking them. And going even more further, we think about subjects who possibly have to stay in the bed all the day, like, you know, bedridden subjects in this case. Maybe they would have bad vision, not so good hearing. So we can also stimulate them inside the bed. So basically, this vibration also will generate those beautiful P300 responses. So basically, this is a val very valid paradigm. And as you will see in this example, I am lying on the bed. So at the top, on the simple example on the bottom. And in this case, based on the vibration, there will be kind of those bigger vibrators in the bed. Let's call it massage bed, which is kind of like now stimulating different parts of my body. And again, I am kind of translating those commands into walking the robot around. We can also do it for the pressure. So in this case, there is a joystick which is generating the pressure. So actually, the subject is keeping it in the hand. And again, this pressure, which is kind of could be part of the video gaming, could be nicely recognized as a P300 response. Again, if you focus on the, on, on the actual direction. And finally, we can transfer this into this kind of managing a small robot. I have four minutes left. OK. So then we move on to kind of our, maybe the best result in this case. So this was the kind of project which received in 2014 BCI award. In this case, we compared classical tactile sensation. So there will be the small vibrators attached to the hand. So you have really physical device. And we combine this with so-called auditory, like uh, ultrasonic auditory matrix, which basically is causing the ultrasonic waves, acoustic wave, focus in the single point. So when you put your hands under, you really feel this kind of touch sensation. So in this video, we just, for example, so this would be kind of an ultrasonic beam forming pattern. If you put water, uh, there's actually coffee, you will really see that actually those patterns are causing kind of change in the water surface. So it's kind of like an ultrasonic, it's like 40 kilohertz, so it's above the hearing level. But basically, this uh, acoustic wave is really pushing the surface of the water. So once you put your hands under, you have this kind of very nice, very kind of precise tactile sensation. So it's kind of touch without touch. P300 responses were really beautiful. I think they're going like even 10 microvolts for some subjects. And we could really like, you know, manage also the, the robots. So we are closer to classical virtual reality at the end of my talk. And this will be an example, again, with kind of motion onset BCIs. So basically, most of, the, most of the BCIs are related to kind of flashing something. But we also know our visual system is super sensitive to the motion. Like when something is flying, something is dropping, you basically will realize. So we kind of make these two patterns kind of offline, uh, like from the center and to, to, to the center. And once you do it on the, like, you know, like in a smartphone and so on, we can very quickly put it into, inside the VR. So imagine your game has some components which are moving. You control the movement. You have like, you know, full, like, you know, and you can really see if the subject is interacting with these moving parts or not. And again, as usual, fantastic P300. Also, one student made it into AR. So basically, if you have, like, you know, in this case, smartphone which has a camera, so he kind of make interface that actually has kind of overlay in this case of those moving patterns. So maybe video is not perfect, but this is like, you know, for the stereo vision in the VR. And you can look at the real interface on the computer. So basically people who cannot like, you know, in this case, interact with the usual screen, they can have this kind of overlay of P300 related, like, you know, in this case, we had kind of small shaking. There was no flashing and it was also working quite well. So uh, maybe the last example. We can also use like kind of continuous stimulation. And this is so called CVEP stimulation when we can use pseudo random sequences. So it's much better than classical fixed frequency stimulation. So, exact, again, one more example with two students. Each of them has own frame with nine flashing LEDs. Sorry, this is video, so this is really not like a you know, good reproduction of the flashing. But all of them are flashing with kind of higher frequency pseudo random sequences. So they're very friendly, very easy to use. And in this case, again, they're kind of managing two robots. We had this kind of always concept. If they can do something together, they would be kind of like reinforcing each other. So again, on the YouTube, there is a full video. They make this kind of full walking sequence. I think even one student is making mistake at the end, and then he's coming back. So this full control, it's really working. We also extended this later for the 16 flashing sequences. So this is basically exactly the same pseudo random sequence, so-called M code, which is used in the telecommunication. So we basically take something from telecommunication. This is kind of like orthogonal sequence. 
We just shifted it on the one bit, so basically later on it's possible to classify. And so there would be like, no, this would be like 16 different LEDs. He's moving his, in the video, there would be sound. He's moving his eyes, and we can really see which of the commands he's choosing. And this, again, was a student project, but actually kind of got also like BCI award nomination that kind of time. So it's also quite good. And, oh, well, I am at the end. And one more would be the active BCI in this case. So we would use it for the like, you know, real musical performances. So I will just show on one video. But in this case, you can use like imagination of the musician. This was like a you know, professional musician. He kind of managed to create five patterns of the musical imaginations. And we could play the, in this case, full video. Uh, sorry, play music. And since I am over time, let me quickly, very quickly jump to our current project of the dementia. So we can use BCI for the monitoring, but we can also use it as a biomarker. So we know the brains are shrinking. And this is a big problem in, in Japan now, and that's why they really uh, invest a lot in that. So we know that the number of dementia are growing. Like, you know, our societies are aging. Our like, you know, physical health is really fantastic, but our mental health is not so good. As already the World Health Organization suggested, we can use many non-pharmacological approaches, like, you know, to even delay our dementia, changing lifestyle, changing sports, and so on. So we really want to create biomarker which will really measure which one is good. And it's not like, you know, one fits everybody. So basically, some people can make sports, some people may be like more social activities. We know that we have mostly Alzheimer and the vascular dementia, so the right one would be like electrical activity base. The right one is vascular, is the blood system, so in this case, we can use NIRS. And basically, the concept is if you measure it, you can maybe improve it. So this is all kind of saying of Lord Kevin. And I will try to finalize within the one minute. So, so also, what is really good when you look at the kind of medical paper, there are already several candidates. And P300 response, the famous response we use in the BCI, is one of the biomarker candidates. So it's already known, and this review is really suggesting this is the, the best one. In the healthy people, P300 would be as usual. Once you enter into towards dementia, so-called MCI, P300 is becoming delayed and kind of dropping in the amplitude. And finally, in the Alzheimer diseases, you have really delayed and a very late response. So for that one, we had kind of two experiments designed, one using real and virtual audio, and we could really simulate nicely this kind of changes, red versus blue. So we could really reproduce this kind of, like, you know, causing due to task load, like more like lower amplitude, in this case, uh, P300. Second example was using this our famous tactile BCI, and in this case, we could nicely reproduce this kind of delay in the P300. So exactly the same subjects, due to task difficulties, their brains were firing a little bit later, because, you know, more thinking. And we use quite many classifiers. i skip all the map, but let me show you the one slide, which is kind of nicely comparing them. We don't have still very much data, so deep learning is kind of like, you know, still in the, the beginning, but you will see kind of one group of the lower classification results, around 50%, which is close to the chance level. And this would be using usual LDA, kind of like, you know, shallow learning classifiers. Once we use Riemannian geometry family of classifiers, we could push results to around 70%. And if you have 70%, already medical doctors will talk with you because, oh, it's kind of becoming interesting. But at the very end, we use kind of our first prototype of the deep learning using so-called tensor decomposition. And in that case, we can really go push everything up to 80% for the sum subject would be even 90%. This is leave one out. This is classification. So just to close up the summary, you will have less time for questions. So this is kind of concept we really want, want, want to do. So basically, we want people to use this kind of be safe at home. So this is my mother. She gave me permission to do this experiment. And she did this experiment for me. So basically, she's wearing this kind of very simple Muse wearable. So EG is very low quality, but you know, she can do it herself. She could put it herself on the head, squeeze it, and start recording. She has iPad in the hand because we also collect some behavioral responses. We use home appliances like TV and so on to display the simulation. So basically, this must, must be kind of home-based. So very simple P300 response, really behavioral in this case. And we could really see for our different groups of the subjects that we can really already from the response time, we can have a first biomarker. So we have different groups. The blue one would be our like, people who are in the danger. We have them, we have, for them, we have psychological like, evaluations. And their response time are significantly median values are slower comparing to healthy green. This kind of part place is middle-aged people like myself. Orange at the end are students, and now a well-performing 80 years old plus subject will be in the red. So this will be first candidate. Once we look at this kind of nice, in this case, feet, like you know, you will have this MOCA scores, which is this kind of Montreal cognitive uh, evaluation 
of, of the mental scores, we can really say that we have nice kind of linear feed. So as you go into dementia, you have lower scores, your reaction time is getting slower. But it's maybe not enough. So second experiment, when we use uh, responses to the, so actually this kind of training to make uh, emotional evaluations. So in this case, we train our elderly subjects to use two dimensional kind of, uh, like in this case, grid of the valence and the arousal. It's kind of classical emotion evaluation is, uh, test. In this case, we are kind of focusing on the short term memory, so called implicit procedural memory. We also involve in kind of spatial temporal memory, which is kind of weak in the elderly people, and also emotional recognition. Usually, elderly people are quite good with that. So, quickly, experiment would be like that. We have database of like, you know, several hundred emotional displays of the Western people, which we show for the Japanese people. We show them kind of suggestion of the screen where the emotions should be like, you know, put. So they kind of learn to use this kind of path. And later on, they do it on, the, on their screen. So when we look at again on the reaction time, again, our people who low, with lower cognitive scores are slower. When we look at the emotional evaluation, so something new skill they are learning, during training on the left side, all the groups are the same. There is no difference between young, old, and so on. When we look on the right side, for the valence evaluation, so positive, negative emotions, again, all the groups are the same. So elder people are quite good. But when you look at the arousal, arousal is kind of amount of energy like you know, in the emotion. Our elderly people with the lower cognitive score tend to overreact, like you know, so kind of they kind of over they make too big errors. And this is already in this case significant. Again, when you look at the linear fits, we can really see those kind of like you know, the lower cognitive score, the kind of like you know, higher the value, so they make more errors, they are slower. And two more last slides. When we try to classify, so this is the paper submitted, and I hope it will be soon accepted. So we do this kind of binary classification in this case, and most of our classifiers from this kind of shallow learning case are reaching in the median 90% and so on. Still, we have quite big like, you know, spreads of our results, again, leave one, but it's really showing like, how we can use simple experiments to show like, you know, this correlation with the MOCA scores. And this is already accepted paper, so we'll be showing this at the New Reach this year, at the workshop. So in this case, we try to regress, like, you know, so really fully like, you know, predict what is your MOCA score based on these features like mistakes in the valence and the arousal, so how many mistakes you make this evaluation. Reaction times, we also put age, and in this case, education levels, so high, lower education. And in this case, most of our models are kind of close to zero, so they're really close to perfect, and have plus minus two. And this is what psychologists usually do. So we kind of can reproduce mistakes done by the psychologists from the simple, like, you know, task given for the elderly people. So this is my summary, but maybe I will skip, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Sorry for a long time. <laughs>